Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Silkman and welcome to Coffee with the Foul Play Team. It's good to be back. The title of today's presentation is Tipping the Scales of Miss Justice, Wisconsin Style. And this is the story, the very sad story of Brendan Dassey and his journey. This is also the story of another individual whom we'll meet in this presentation. And that is the Attorney General Brad Schimmel. And we need to ask the question, why has he got a smile on his face? And if you're following this um, in the episodes, we're looking at Making a Murderer Season 2, Episodes 7 to 10, if you're following this. Now, just as a big, uh, bit of a, a quick recap, uh, the Attorney General, Brad Schimmel, had released a statement, and I'll read it out. Accordingly, Dassey's release should be regarded as a serious public safety issue. And I drew the comparison uh, between Brendan Dassey, who's a quiet, shy 16-year-old kid at the time, and compared it to Hannibal Lecter. And it was pretty obvious that the Attorney General, Brad Schimmel, was scaring the public. Uh, basically, that the public had to worry uh, if Brendan Dassey was going to be released from prison. So, what one notes here is that the Attorney General, Brad Schimmel, he had appealed every decision that was favourable to Brendan Dassey. So we know that um, there was a panel um, that was going to review Brendan Dassey's case, and this was the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. And on that panel for the review, there were three judges, uh, Judge Williams, Judge Rovner, and Judge Hamilton. And to win the so-called round, you need to command at least two votes from the panel. And so what happens is that a representative of the state uh, and a representative of uh, Brendan Dassey's legal team, uh, they present oral arguments in front of the three judge panel and they're given 20 minutes to present their case. Uh, while they're presenting their case, the uh, judges, they grill um, the um, presenters and ask them a lot of um, very interesting questions. So really, uh, the panel had to answer one particular question, and that is, was Judge Duffin right or wrong in granting writ of habeas corpus to Brendan Dassey. On Thursday, June 22, 2017, this was a very important day because it was the final judgment from the Circuit Court of Appeals. And as we can see here, when Laura Nyrider checked her computer, uh, she only saw one word, one very, very important word, and that was affirmed. So this, of course, caused a real media storm and uh, was all over the news. Uh, and I quote, Brendan Dassey's confession was coerced. So Judge Duffin's decision was affirmed. And remember, there was a three panel uh, of judges. Uh, two of the judges, uh, Judges Williams and Rovner, were in the majority. Uh, they affirmed Judge Duffin's decision. And there was one dissenting judge, uh, Judge Hamilton, who did not agree with Judge Duffin's decision. Now, what happens is that uh, a report was written this is for, for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, and this report was decided, or the, the panel was decided, on June the 22nd, 2017. And so uh, Circuit Judge Rovner 
wrote the response. So what I'm going to do is read some of the passages uh, from Circuit Judge Rovner's response. I quote, Almost the entirety of the state's case rested on these interviews and one phone call between Dassey and his mother after his final police interview, which we described below. There was no physical evidence linking Dassey to the murder of Hallbach. Investigators did not find any of Dassey's DNA or blood on any of the many objects that were mentioned in his confession. The knives in Avery's house, gun, handcuffs, bed, RAV4, key or automotive dolly. The trial court never learned that Kaczynski and O'Kelly had worked to compel Dassey's confession, videotaped O'Kelly interrogating Dassey, exchanged emails describing the whole family as evil and criminals, and without Dassey's knowledge or consent, sent an email to prosecutors on May the 5th, indicating where they thought the murder weapon was hidden. No murder weapon was ever found. These facts did not come to light until the state post-conviction hearings. At trial, the centerpiece of the prosecution's case was Dassey's March 1st confession, in which he admitted to participating in the alleged sexual assault and murder of Horbach, as well as the disposal of her body. Dassey's defense was that his confession was not true or voluntary, that he accepted his uncle's invitation to a bonfire and then helped him gather items from the salvage yard to burn before helping Avery clean up something that looked like automotive fluid from the garage floor staining his pants with bleach in the process. Dassey testified that he did not know why he had said the things that he did to the police investigators and thought and that he thought that the investigators had promised that he would not go to jail no matter what he told them. I continue. After five and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found Dassey guilty on all counts. On August the 2nd, 2007, the trial court sentenced Dassey to life in prison for first degree intentional homicide, not illegible for release to extended supervision until November the 1st, 2048. The court further sentenced Dassey to six years of imprisonment for mutilating a corpse and 14 years imprisonment for second degree sexual assault, both to be served concurrently with a murder se uh, sentence. Dassey appealed his conviction without success. Dassey moved for post-conviction relief in the trial court claiming that his pre-trial and trial counsel provided ineffective assistance and that his March 1st confession was involuntary. Upon his motion, the Wisconsin State Court held a five-day hearing beginning January the 15th, 2010, which included the testimony of Dassey's mother, his school psychologist, one of his trial attorneys, the prosecutor, a social psychologist, Kaczynski, O'Kelly, and Richard Leo, an expert on false confessions. The Circuit Court of Wisconsin denied Dassey's post-conviction relief on December the 13th, 2010. The primary cause of police-induced false confessions is the use of psychologically coercive police interrogation methods. These include methods that were once identified with the old third degree, such as deprivation, 
of food, sleep, water, or access to bathroom facilities, for example. In communicando interrogation, an extreme induced exhaustion and fatigue. Since the 1940s, however, these techniques have become rare in domestic police interrogations. Instead, when today's police interrogators employ psychologically coercive techniques, they usually consist of implicit or explicit promises of leniencies and implicit or explicit threats of harsher treatment in combination with other interrogation techniques, such as accusation, repetition, attacks on denials and false evidence ploys. And this came from John B. Gould and Richard A. Leo. And you can see on the right hand side a picture of Professor Richard Leo, who I had the pleasure uh, of speaking to uh, in a uh, live um, interview session that, that we did uh, a few weeks ago. And I learned a rule lot from Professor Richard Leo. Now, we can see here the very, very sad picture. We'll never, ever forget this. Uh, and this is where Brendan uh, uttered to his mum, Barb, uh, after Brendan had so-called confessed, they got to my head. And during the Brendan Dassey trial, uh, Special Prosecutor uh, Thomas J. Fallon uttered the words that uh, innocent people don't confess. Well, Circuit Judge Rovner wrote, and I quote, in closing arguments at trial, the state argued that people who are innocent don't confess. We know, however, that innocent people do in fact confess and do so with shocking regularity. The state appellate court did not give Dassey's confession the consideration required when evaluating the voluntariness of a confession of an intellectually disabled juvenile. Now, Circuit Judge Hamilton uh, wrote a uh, descending, he was a dissenting judge, and he also wrote um, a reply, and I'll read part of it. Hamilton, Circuit Judge, dissenting. Brendan Dassey confessed on videotape that he raped Teresa Horbach helped his uncle murder her and then burn her body in a fire pit at his uncle's junkyard. A jury convicted Dassey of those crimes and the Wisconsin state courts have upheld the convictions. On federal habeas corpus review, however, Dassey has persuaded the district court and now my colleagues that his confession was involuntary and his convictions invalid. I respectfully dissent. We should reverse. He also said this. Take note. I read and see the evidence quite differently. Dassey's confession appears to have been the product of a guilty conscience, coaxed rather gently from him with standard non-coercive investigative techniques. Even assuming, however, that the majority's interpretation is plausible, our job as a federal court reviewing a state conviction under 2254D is not to consult scholarly literature in search of new best practices. This was a relatively brief and low-key interview of a Miranda-sized subject who was not mistreated or threatened, whose creature comforts were satisfied and whose parent consented. If such a gentle interrogation can be treated as unconstitutionally coercive, what should police do the next time an investigation leads to a teenager with some intellectual challenges? Few wrongdoers are eager to own up to crimes as seriously as Dassey's. 
the Constitution is not offended by such police tactics as encouraging the subject to tell the truth, bluffing about what the police already know, or confronting the subject with what the police know from physical evidence and with the internal contradictions and impossibilities in the story Today's decision will make some police investigations considerably more difficult with little gain in terms of justice. Now, Circuit Judge Hamilton said something very, very interesting in his report, and I quote, we also should not lose sight of the most damning physical evidence, the bones of Teresa Horbach, broken and charred, buried in the ashes of Avery's burn pit. The corpus delicti does not point inexorably to Dassey, but it is a grim corroboration for much of the story he told the investigators. Uh, and you can see um, Stephen Avery's uh, burn pit or burn area uh, with Bear overlooking it. And uh, I went over this uh, when we looked at, or when I looked at uh, Dehan's uh, affidavit. And just to remind uh, listeners and viewers that um, Dr. Dehan, who was a forensic fire scientist, um, addressed the issue of um, the burn pit and I quote this is in uh, his uh, amended affidavit from 2019 in which he said uh, it is further my opinion that the body was not burned in the burn pit for the following reasons and Dehan gave the reasons why he didn't suspect that a human being was not burned in the burn pit and then in point 11, uh, Dr. Dehan stated that it is my opinion that someone transferred some of Teresa Horbach's bone after burning. So now that the decision was out, uh, again, uh, this made a lot of headlines in the, in the uh, media and Brendan's lawyers now wanted to file a motion to have Brendan Dassey released. And I quote, with the state vowing to fight the panel's two to one decision, Laura and Steve seek Brendan's immediate release on bond. Uh, and um, they also spoke with Governor Walker uh, about getting uh, Brendan Dassey released. And Governor Walker said, well, it's probably best to let the courts handle it. Now, of course, they interviewed um, the Attorney General Brad Schimmel uh, after the result was released from the circuit court uh, and uh, Brad Schimmel released a statement and I'll quote, the Wisconsin Department of Justice send their condolences to the Horbach family. Again, it's pretty obvious that the Attorney General uh, wants to get himself involved in Brendan's case as much as possible. Uh, and he obviously believes that Brendan Dassey is guilty and does not want to see Brendan Dassey released under any circumstances. But again, he's appealing to the emotions uh, by saying, oh, we send uh, condolences to the Hallbach family. Now, what was very interesting was that in the Making a Murder episode, Stephen Avery was obviously on a phone call and he stated during that phone call, he said, Brendan has been coerced and had been set up. And he also, Stephen Avery also made the very interesting comment that had it been anybody else apart from Brendan Dassey, uh, that person would have been released by now. Now, Kathleen Zona made the very interesting comment. She said that something could happen to Brendan while in prison. Clearly, it was throughout all the media that Brendan was going to be released. 
Uh, and Circuit Judge Rovner wrote the following. And in fact, that is just what occurred in this case. Detectives continues, continually challenged Dassey's statements and accused him of lying until, as we will describe, his confession became a litany of inconsistencies, shirts that changed colour, fires that began and ended at different times, garbage bags that sat in burning fires without melting, trucks that were seen in garages and then not seen in garages, bloody crime scenes without a trace of blood remaining, metal handcuffs that left no marks on the bedposts, etc. Although we report the evolution of his confession linearly, it is far from that. Dassey's story changes. He backtracks. Officers try to pin him down on time frames and details, but they are like waves on the sand. Even the state has trouble telling its version of the timeline of the story in any cogent manner due to the fact that it changed with each retelling. The Seventh Circuit orders the state to respond to Laura and Steve's motion for release on bond by 5 p.m. on Monday, June the 26, 2017. And it was very interesting how in the media, uh, Brendan Dassey was referred to as one of Wisconsin's most notorious convicted killers. And of course, uh, the Attorney uh, General, Brad Schimmel, said he should remain behind bars. So Laura and Steve have until 5 p.m. the next day to file their reply to the state's opposition to releasing Brendan on bond. And that date was Tuesday, June the 27th, 2017. And that's the filing deadline for both Laura and Steve. So both Laura and Steve, they work all night uh, to try and get the response done on time. And just before 2 p.m., Laura and Steve filed their reply to the state's opposition for releasing Brendan on bond. So, on Wednesday, June the 28th, 2017, this is just one day after Laura and Steve filed their reply, the Seventh Circuit denies Laura and Steve's motion to release Brendan on bond. That meant that Brendan had to remain in prison. Brett Schimmel, of course, appeared on the media and he made some comments about the Seventh Circuit Court and he stated, the panel is given to you randomly and you don't know what you're going to get. We think the judge, that's Judge Duffin, got it very wrong. And finally, hopefully we will get some finality soon for Teresa Horbach's family. Now, for the Seventh Circuit oral arguments, from 2000 to 2016, uh, 12,336 cases were heard by the three-judge panel. Of that, only 42 cases were reheard on bunk. That's by the full uh, panel of judges. That represents a percentage of only 0.3%. So the chance that your case after being heard by a three judge panel to be heard by the full on bunk uh, court panel is extremely rare. However, no surprises here, the on bunk review was granted. That meant that the uh, seventh 
uh, circuit on bunk review was going to hear uh, the state's appeal in the case. So here is the order, and I'll, I'll read a little bit from the uh, order. The panel's opinion and judgment issued on June the 22nd, 2017, are vacated. Oral argument will be heard on Tuesday, September the 26th, 2017. So what does that actually mean? It means that the case has to be re-argued again as if it never happened previously. And you can see here uh, both Nyrider and Drizzen, um, they are very, very devastated by this decision. Uh, this, of course, meant that uh, Laura Nyrider had to go back to the drawing board yet again. And so she had to basically uh, uh, go through the um, presentation all over again. And uh, what they normally do is they use um, parts of their team and staff uh, to represent judges uh, that will be present on the uh, on bonk panel uh, to basically simulate and anticipate the types of questions that the judges are going to throw um, at Laura Nyrider. So it's very, very frustrating because she has to represent the entire arguments all over again. One of the issues faced by Brendan Dassey's um, attorneys is the so-called Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. Uh, and I quote Laura Nyrider, Federal courts can only grant relief if a state court was unreasonably wrong, was so wrong that no other judge, no other fair-minded judge could possibly agree with the state court. That's an incredibly high bar. So it puts a lot of pressure on the defense team. So as we can see here uh, in this slide, we have a very concerned Steve Drizzen. And he stated, we need to secure four votes to keep Judge Duffin's opinion in place. And so here is the en banc review panel. Uh, and these are the seven judges that have been selected. And if we look at the uh, original uh, court session in which there were three judges, you can see the two judges uh, shown in the green box that uh, agreed uh, with Judge Duffin's uh, ruling. And we have the uh, dissenting judge, uh, Judge Hamilton, uh, shown here in red. Kathleen Zellner, who's got a lot of experience uh, in these situations, uh, made a very, very key and important statement. I quote, the key to winning any case uh, is your grasp of the facts. And that's what will shift the judge to your position. And if it was something that they just did not realize, the challenge is how you present the story. So the en banc oral arguments in Brendan's case before the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago was set for September the 26th, 2017. Uh, and each uh, person has 30 minutes this time to present their case. Uh, and representing the state uh, from the Wisconsin Deputy Solicitor General Office uh, was Luke Berg. Uh, and uh, we can see here from Brendan's post-conviction team, uh, representing Brendan will be Laura Nyrider again. Now, um, a lot of people showed up, of course, um, to the uh, trial. Uh, Teresa Horbach's family, of course, were there. The Attorney General, Brad Schimmel, showed up. Tom Fallon, who was the Assistant Attorney General, uh, he showed up as well. Um, Brendan's mum and stepfather showed up. Carla Chase, who is Stephen's niece, she was there. Um, 
Jerome Buting, who was a Stevens trial lawyer, he showed up, and also a Robert Dvorak, who was Brendan's post-conviction lawyer. And of course, there was a lot of media present as well. So each participant had 30 minutes to present in front of the a full en banc panel. And of course, uh, Luke Berg, um, he appeared first and he started off his arguments by saying, uh, Brendan Dassey confessed because his guilt became unbearable. Uh, next was the turn of uh, Laura Nyrider, in which in her oral arguments, she had mentioned um, a promise of leniency to Brendan Dassey, and that's the reason why he confessed. Now, I want to say that the, um, the judging panel uh, was very, very scathing on both uh, Laura and Luke that asked a lot of very, very tough questions. At the uh, end of the presentations, um, the press uh, afterwards uh, started asking various people questions. And uh, of course, Brad Schimmel, uh, the Attorney General, he was questioned. And one of the reporters had asked him to make a comment um, about how one of the judges said about the uh, testimony or, or the coercion of Brendan Dassey when she listened to the um, uh, his uh, playback, it made her skin crawl. And uh, the uh, reporter had asked um, uh, Brad Schimmel, what did he think about that statement? And uh, Brad uh, Schimmel said the following, and I quote, what makes my skin crawl is knowing the things that happened to Teresa Hallbach not that, that this young man is uncomfortable talking about it, reliving it. Teresa's family relives this every day. Okay, well, the case was argued on September the 26th, 2017. It was decided on December the 8th, 2017. Uh, and as we can see from uh, this uh, media grab. It states, court upholds Brendan Dassey's conviction, making a murderer figure to stay in prison. <clears throat> and as you can see here, uh, the Seventh Court of Appeals voted four to three. That means that uh, Brendan Dassey's uh, team had lost uh, from four uh, counts to three. Now, the on bank majority opinion, this was written by Judge Hamilton. Uh, and in his uh, reply, he wrote the following comments. I quote, he signed and initialed a Miranda waiver and his mother consented. Quote, at no point in the interview did the investigators threaten Dassey or his family? They did not even raise their voices. Quote, Dassey never refused to answer questions and never tried to stop the interview. Quote, the Supreme Court has considered and rejected claims similar to Dassey's. The District Court's grant of habeas relief is reversed and it probably explains why uh, the attorney general has got a smile on his face ken kratz has got a smile on his face fallon has got a smile on his face and poor brendan dassey uh, is in a whole lot of trouble and this meant that the decision um, by judge duffin is effectively reversed Now, what was interesting was that uh, Circuit Judge Hamilton uh, stated a few uh, points uh, in his response. And I'll read them out to you and I'll go uh, through these in detail. Uh, point number three, uh, given the damage to Teresa's body, few of these details could have been confirmed or contradicted by the surviving physical evidence. 
But what did survive elsewhere does not necessarily vindicate Dassey. For example, Dassey contends that no handcuff marks were found on the headboard of Stephen Avery's bed, but a thin plastic film from a substance used in rope manufacturing was found on the headboard. And so um, Sharika Cohen was questioned about this during the Stephen Avery trial. And I quote, question, you swab the handcuffs and the leg irons? Answer, yes. Question, and you found no DNA of Teresa Horbach on those items, did you? Answer, no. Question, okay. And as to the handcuffs and leg irons, you did find some DNA on it though, didn't you? Answer, yes I did. Question, you found Mr. Avery's own DNA. Answer, in a mixture sample, yes. Question, in a mixture with, another, with some other male, right? Answer, I can't tell for sure whether it was a male or a female. Question, well, it wasn't a mixture with Teresa Horbach. Answer, correct. In the second point that uh, Judge Hamilton makes, he goes, I quote, uh, this point number four, this portion of Dassey's confession also led to another search of Stephen Avery's garage that uncovered perhaps the most powerful physical evidence of the investigation, a bullet fragment with Teresa Horbuck's DNA on it. And remember, Ken Kratz called um, Ida Mephel, the bullet fragment, as the game changer. Well, we now know that this indeed is not the case, because uh, if we remember Dr. Palanek from Microtrace, his uh, affidavit, when uh, Cherie Cohen examined Ida Mephel, she had noted uh, no blood, no stains, no tissue, and she also contaminated the PCR negative control and that she required a deviation request form just to submit um, that uh, evidence to trial. When Dr. Palanek examined Ida Mephel uh, under a high powered microscope, um, he found no bone shards, but the presence of wood shards, a red paint flex, a waxy substance and cotton fibers. So as you can see, these two points um, that uh, Circuit Judge Hamilton makes are really moot and not important at all. But this one uh, gained my attention a real lot. Uh, and Circuit Judge Hamilton mentioned the following. This is point number seven. At trial, Dassey gave no explanation for his March 1st confession beyond controverted expert testimony that he was highly suggestible and a suggestion that he had confused his own experiences on October the 31st with a book he had obstensibly read three, four years before called Kiss the Girls. No scenes in either the book or the movie it inspired are remotely similar to the crimes Dassey described on March the 1st. Uh, see generally uh, James Patterson, Kiss the Girls, first edition, 1995, Kiss the Girls, Paramount Pictures, 1997, fictional coast-to-coast -coast hunt for serial killers. Also, in nearly six months after March the 1st, Dassey never mentioned the book or movie to his then counsel. But it really does beg the question, whether um, Circuit Judge Hamilton actually did see the movie or read the book. Because if we have a look at Kiss the Girls, let's have a look at some of the more um, um, disturbing scenes that were depicted in the movie. So the actual movie shows that one, a white female was shown restrained in bed by her hands and her feet, there were images of shackles and restraining devices. Uh, the victim was sexually assaulted. A knife had been held to the throat of the victim. There was a kitchen knife with a black handle. Uh, hair 
had been cut off one of the victims uh, some of the victims were murdered and victims were shown in flames now if we have a look at the so-called features of Brendan's confession well Teresa was restrained in bed by her hands and feet uh, handcuffs and leg irons were found in Stephen Avery's trailer uh, Teresa was allegedly sexually assaulted there was a knife held to the throat of Teresa uh, and her throat was cut uh, the kitchen knife had a black handle uh, according to Brendan Teresa had some of her hair cut off Teresa was allegedly murdered and Teresa was burnt in Stephen Avery's burn pit and uh, that begs the question did circuit judge Hamilton actually watch or read kiss the girls because the elements of Brendan's confession mirror exactly what is shown in the film kiss the girls now remember in the film and only in the film uh, was one of the victims uh, hair cut off which Brendan Dassey had mentioned uh, during his so-called confession but what is really interesting here is the way the dissenting judge uh, Chief Judge Wood uh, handled the statement regarding kiss the girls so she um, uh, came up with a table and she actually mentioned uh, the book kiss the girls so um, as a critical fact uh, Dassey sexually assaulted Hallbark while she was handcuffed to the bed why is it not critical the details was drawn from popular media how was it coerced Dassey testified that he concocted this detail from kiss the girls 1995 a book he read uh, where a woman is restrained during a sexual assault but I believe that Brendan Dassey most likely recently saw the film kiss the girls he may or may not have read the book but it's likely that he saw the film and that film was being shown in Wisconsin at that time now the on bunk descending opinion was also written by Chief Judge Wood and she states and I quote Dassey will spend the rest of his life in prison because of the injustice this court has decided to leave unredressed I respectfully dissent she also further said in her statement I quote when the suspect is a minor courts must review the confession and record with special care quote Dassey was fed the fact that Avery went under the RAV4 hood Dassey was fed that she was shot in the garage quote APA does not paralyze us in the face of a clear constitutional violation quote without this involuntary and highly unreliable confession the case against Dassey was almost non-existent uh, also Judge Rovner wrote the following quote it is time to bring our understanding of coercion into the 21st century quote innocent people do in fact confess quote no reasonable state court could possibly have concluded that Dassey's confession was voluntarily given I view this as a profound miscarriage of justice I respectfully dissent Brendan's mother Barbara Tadich sent out the following um, comment and I quote I wish these judges and Tom Fallon could have met Brendan in person to see the real Brendan Dassey Carla Chase sent out the following as well wanted to let everyone know that Brendan is doing okay Barb told him to keep hopes up 
because they're not stopping or giving up, pushing forward and harder than ever. So now really uh, the last form of um, uh, place that uh, Brendan's uh, uh, lawyers can go uh, is to take it to the Supreme Court of the United States. And as we can see here, uh, each year the Supreme Court, um, they take around about 8,000 cases. There's about 8,000 cases that are requested, but the Supreme Court of the United States only accepts 80 of the cases. That's very rare that you're going to be able to present in front of the Supreme Court. And so uh, they put in their uh, submission and on June the 25th, 2018, the news for Brendan Dassey, unfortunately, was devastating. And that was the Supreme Court won't hear the appeal of making a murderer subject, Brendan Dassey. Again, um, the Attorney General Brad Schirmel uh, pipes up and um, he wrote the following. We hope the family and friends of Miss Holbach can find comfort in knowing this ordeal has finally come to a close. And uh, no wonder Brad Schimmel's always got a smile on his face because he was instrumental uh, in appealing every decision that went um, positive for Brendan Dassey and his attorneys. So regrettably, uh, we're left with the situation, the current situation, um, when a MAM2 was filmed, that Brendan had been in prison 12 of his uh, 29 years uh, and at that stage uh, he remains at Columbia Correctional and he will be eligible for early release in 2048 at the age of 59. Now remember he's in prison as a result of words, just words. Okay guys that's the end of the presentation. My apologies that it was a long one. But it was a story that had to be told. Uh, and uh, my name is Dr. Silkman from the Foul Play team. And you'll notice here that we've done two additional uh, coffee with Foul Play episodes uh, in regards to Brendan Dassey. Uh, and one of them is entitled Words and Only Words and Words Only. And the last one is a serious public safety issue. And I just want to say personally, that um, it's been a, a personal struggle for myself and also for the foul play team, especially when we come to deal with uh, Brendan Dassey. Uh, he's a, he was a young boy of only 16 years old. Um, at the time, he's obviously got limited uh, mental uh, facilities, capabilities, and he was really taken apart by Fassbender and Wigert. Um, he didn't have a, a, a guardian or an attorney present uh, when the questioning took place and he really got taken advantage of. Uh, and not only that, that's borne out by the fact that um, we get Fassbender had asked Brendan Dassey without the presence of an attorney to make a phone call the day after to his mother. And uh, in a way, Brendan sort of like semi-confessed about doing some of it, but we now know that some of it didn't mean that he actually had com committed the crime. The sum of it meant that he actually did go over and help um, his uncle Stephen in the garage and uh, was very, very sad indeed um, how his words were misconstrued. And, um, you know, he, Brendan didn't have proper legal representation especially with Kaczynski and Michael O'Kelly. So a lot of things went wrong with Brendan. Uh, Nye Ryder and Drizzen tried their best and not forgetting that um, things went favorably uh, in the habeas corpus and also with the on bunk, the original three panel judges. But um, as usual, uh, Brad Schimmel was extremely tenacious, did not want to uh, let go of this case 
and ultimately was successful, uh, which unfortunately to this day, uh, Brendan Dassey remains um, as a prisoner. Thank you very much and um, hope to catch you all soon uh, in another presentation. But this um, is our final coffee presentation where we have looked at both MAM1 and MAM2. And guys, all of us from the Foul Play team would like to thank you all very much for your support. Uh, we have um, uh, well over a thousand subscribers. And if you like what we do, please subscribe to our channel and hit the thumbs up button. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Listening to hey. with Foul Play. Thank you, Sammy. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our, our final coffee with Foul Play. Um, I hope you enjoyed the uh, recording. Um, and what we did is that uh, we reviewed um, Making a Murderer, uh, episodes uh, 7 uh, through to 10. Uh, and we focus predominantly on Brendan Dassey and his story up to the stage. And um, I'm very honoured um, to have uh, a large uh, panel uh, here today, and I'll read them out. Uh, we, joining us today uh, for our discussion uh, after the presentation, we have uh, Alice Irvine, we have Bibi, we have Big Jeff, we have Galataki, Glenn Joe, Jack61, Kim Eastwood, we have Neverly, Nothing But a Stump, Not My Verbiage, Sicilian, Susan, Wizard, and Sammy. And guys, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the discussion. Uh, I just want to make a few little uh, comments first, and then we'll open up the panel. Uh, essentially, uh, what we did is that we finished the review uh, of what happened to Brendan Dassey uh, and his trials and tribulations. Uh, and we followed his story um, and we talked about the uh, legal representation that Brendan initially had, uh, and it was a, a complete disaster for him. Uh, both Nye Ryder and Drizzen uh, took up the cause and they worked extremely hard um, to present his case um, uh, to get justice for him. And uh, we must never forget that they were successful in getting um, uh, a decision favourable to Brendan Dassey, and that was that Judge Duffin had um, agreed that Brendan Dassey's um, confession was coerced and that it should be thrown out and that he should be released from prison immediately. Um, his uh, attorneys had filed uh, for a bond uh, to get Brendan released, uh, and regrettably that was um, blocked by the Attorney General uh, Brad Schimmel. Uh, they then uh, presented their case towards the Seventh Circuit Court uh, in front of a three-judge panel, and again, uh, Brendan's attorneys had won, 2-1. Uh, and again, they put in a submission to have Brendan uh, released on bond uh, from prison. And regrettably, it was blocked again by the Attorney General Brad Schimmel. Uh, this then went to a full Seventh Circuit port, Court of Appeals in front of seven judges. Regrettably, uh, Brendan Dassey's attorneys had lost the case, narrowly lost the case for three. Uh, which meant that Brendan Dassey had to remain in prison. Um, his attorneys, Drizzen and Nyrider, tried to present their case uh, to the federal court. Uh, unfortunately, they declined to take the case. So, guys, we're left with a very uncomfortable and, in my opinion, a very unsatisfactory situation in which we have uh, then the then very young man of 16 years old is now sitting in prison and won't be eligible for release until 2048. Uh, it was a very, very tough story for me to tell personally. I've had many, many excellent discussions with the panel uh, on Brendan Dassey and, of course, on Stephen Avery. But uh, the Brendan Dassey story is a real heartbreaker. 
So, guys, enough of my uh, jibber-jabbering. I want to open it up to the panel, guys. Tell me what you think. Let's start asking questions. Uh, not my verbiage. Have you got a, a comment? Yeah, um, I'd like to say thank you for your presentation. It was really clear and precise. <laughs> but um, I have a thank question you. is, but when um, the first um, set of judges, or Judge Duffin made his um, ruling, and it was in favor of Brendan, and it, then the state came in and did their thing, of course, and it yes. went to the second one. Do they, and, and so on, up, up to where he ended up losing, but do they take into consideration what the other judges say, or do they just look at it as a clean slate again? Uh, you mean the second time round or the yes. first time round? In the well, second time round, yeah. the second in front of the full panel, they start all over again. Okay. So everything is null and void, which means the that um, both uh, Nye Ryder and Luke Berg had to represent their arguments in front of the seven judge panel. Um, so yeah, they literally had to start again. So they don't take into consideration what any of the other judges had said about the case after that then, right? No, they don't that, they, oh, okay. no they, literally, they literally start again. And mm. so they had to argue their uh, case uh, and they had to uh, answer the same question. Uh, was yeah. Judge Duffin correct or incorrect in granting uh, habe uh, the writ of habeas corpus? So that's mm. why it's a very frustrating thing because they had to, they had to start all over again. Yeah. Um, so when they do yeah. the seven panel, it's seven new judges. It's not uh, those first three that were involved. They're like correct, five correct, men. correct, correct. Um, those um, those three judges were still part of the panel, um, and so I think there was a pool of nine judges altogether, and they select seven. Uh, and those three that were in the original uh, panel, they were there. They were yeah. there. You see that that's what I don't understand is they're you know they're basing it on the trial or or what their lawyers and the state is saying again, but there there's been judges who are obviously a little more well versed in the laws and they yes. are agreeing with um that this was wrong, but yet they can't use that decision to for other judges to look at and make a decision so to me that seems like a little unfair I mean I just yes. you know. I just don't see the logic of not letting judges, um, their opinions go on to the next judge so they can read that too, because it, it should make a big difference if it would go any further from that. You know what I'm saying? Yes. If, if they can see, yeah. I, I just am a little confused by that. I just don't understand it. Yeah. It, it's basically a clean slate. So they start all over again. And that's the frustrating thing. But what you notice, right? Uh, the judges that uh, affirmed Judge Duffin's decision also affirmed his decision the second time round. And Judge Hamilton, who dissented the first time round, he dissented the second time round. So what it tells you is that those three judges did not change their decision. They kept their what decision. What exactly is dissented? Uh, well, it depends on <laughs> it depends on whether we're talking about the first case or the second one. So, by uh, dissenting, it means that they uh, went against Judge Duffin. If they affirmed, it means that they agreed with Judge Duffin. So, in the first case, uh, Brendan Dassey's attorneys actually won two one, and uh, really. It was up to the state to decide what they wanted to do. But the state, uh, they opposed it and wanted to go to the full panel. So they had the option of just walking away, but they decided to contest it. Uh, Susan, do you, Susan, do you have a comment? Yes, I'm, I'm wondering, after the three-panel uh, decision and Schimmel... Um, tried to block Brendan from getting out at that point. Who exactly makes that decision that, no, he has to stay in prison? Well, basically the way it works is once the decision is made, uh, the state has got options. 
uh, the state. Uh, so basically, uh, with that three-judge panel, uh, technically speaking, uh, they could have released Brendan, right? Because yes. the panel, the panel affirmed Judge Duffin's decision. And right. if you remember from the presentation, Judge Duffin said, Brendan needs to be released from prison, right? And yes. they blocked yes. it. They blocked it. So even going on a bond, the state blocked that. The state didn't want him out, full stop. So when they went to the three panel and Brendan's attorneys actually won, technically speaking, they could have released Brendan then and there. But the state fought it, right? They the state in, appeal, uh, <coughs> appealed. They appealed. They appealed. Correct. So who is it that makes the decision that, no, he actually has to stay in prison until this is settled? Well, the, 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 full, the, the attorney general, but he went to the seventh full court That's of what appeals. I yeah, they, they went to the full court of appeals and they said, yes, denied. And they didn't even give a reason. But is right. that from the seven judges? Is it one leading judge that makes that decision? I'd yeah, go. now now that I don't know. I'd have but to look that they, up. I'd have to look that up, Susan. Hold on. Yes. Where you guys okay. are. Yes, but what they said was, yes, denied, Brendan had to remain in prison. Right. So uh, what, what Nye Ryder and Drizzle wanted to do was to say, hey, look, we can fight it out legally, release this kid, let him go home that actually prevented him from even stepping foot out of prison. Right. Uh, uh, um, Susan, do you have a further comment? No, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Wizard, do you have a comment? Uh, I do sense that Susan mentioned Schimmel's name. And what got me from your presentation is that you highlighted the way um, all of Brendan's appeals had been fought yes. by Schimmel in their Correct. way uh, to oppose all of his all of his petitions. And what gets me is that even in even in his final appeal, um, one of the things that Schimmel does particularly is that his opening gambit with the press is the Holbeck family. The first words out of his Correct. mouth were, my condolences are to the Holbeck family. Blah, 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 yes. Having to go through all this again and all the rest of it. Now, in my view, they're trying Brendan Dassey in the press again before yes. he's even got anywhere near the appeal court. So it's manipulation of the press. If, if Correct. And he does that every time, every appeal. He goes up and he uses the Holbeck family as a shield. And what yes. that does is it sends out a psychological message to the listening public. He knows what he's doing. He wants people to hear what he's saying. It evokes a feeling of sympathy immediately. People start yes. thinking of the Holbeck family, what they went through, all those press conferences. Oh, poor Teresa. And then the connection's made to Teresa. And then the connection's made with all the allegations that Brendan kind of carried out to try and, and so people are automatically thinking no 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 he's got to stay inside he's got to stay away correct so it turns correct. public sympathy again yep. it reinforces a, a hatred within yes, the community to, towards Brendan Bassey and Stephen Avery it's correct. trial by media correct and correct. it's fucking wrong and he, yes. and he, uh, he is the AG is the chief legal officer within the state. Ultimately, Correct. it's his decision that Brendan has to stay in prison because he's yes. the one launching the appeal against Laura and Stephen. So he Correct. sat there and he's thought, I'm not fucking having this. No, he picks up the phone, gets in, gets in touch with the call. Oh, we we'll clerk a call, right, my name's Brad Schimmel. I'm launching an appeal. You'll have to pay for it in 24 hours. It's he, he's the one that decides. What he needs to do from that point is rely on the judges to back his decision up. Yes. Which they do. Now, you've got to ask yourself, in light of 
everything that's become known at the time of that appeal, that en banc hearing is just, it's, 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 the whole thing is just reek of cover up and phone calls and favours and political manoeuvring. It's all, Correct. It, it's all backdoor. There's no justice here. None at all. Shimmel's no. a dog. He, he knows how to manipulate the public before he's even filed the paperwork for his opposition to Brendan's release. Correct, correct. Yeah, uh, Wizard, absolutely spot on. Uh, yeah. As you know, um, there was a massive media campaign against both Brendan and also Stephen, and you're right. Um, what, what Brad Schimmel did, remember, he's in a very powerful position uh, within the uh, legal system in Wisconsin. And uh, all he has to do is give a phone call and whisper into the ears of the right people, and uh, Brendan is uh, doomed. Um, Big Jeff, did you have a comment? I did, Dr. Silkman. Thank you very much uh, for your excellent presentation. Uh, Thank you. My, com my, my comment is um, that my, my recollection here, and you know, it, could be, it could be flawed, was, was that uh, when you do an on-bank presentation, uh, the reason why I call it on bank is that every single judge is invited. So, uh, my, but my recollection, and maybe, maybe Jax knows better, is that there was a vacancy uh, on that court at that time. And that additionally, that another there one was, of the judges there was, had a... Ha, there, there was a vacancy? And, Go ahead. And, there was a, and another one uh, had a planned vacation. I think he went on a fishing trip. He retired. So that, he retired. He retired. So that left seven. And what the, way, the way that this works is that when judges make a ruling, that ruling is the current law. So the thing is that the, um, you know, had that judge not retired, uh, then all Brendan would have needed was a tie because the current law was that, could, that the confession is ineligible. If that had come in, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> four to four, then, then, the, then the ruling would have stood because there wouldn't have been enough judges to overturn the current law, which was the which was the um, uh, which was the uh, confession was inadmissible. So, yes. Uh, so, so you know, when you talk about dissent and whatnot, you have to understand what the current law is, and every time the judge, every time time the judges rule it, that could change the law. So yes. Um, uh, so, to me, you know, I don't know if they strategically, uh, you know. I agree with conveniently? you. Conveniently. Conveniently. Yeah. Conveniently. <laughs> that, yeah, it's uh, just, just unbelievable the, the lucky timing uh, of that with this judge uh, not available to, uh, to, to, you know, to see, did he conveniently retire? Did he not want to weigh in on this? Was it political payola? It, it certainly does reek of that, doesn't it? Uh, this by, missed by one decision. Uh, yeah. just, was just, was he just, told to leave now? Yeah. Yeah. As I recall, that particular judge was really uh, on Brendan's side that he, I'd have to remember that interview he gave. But he Based on his previous decisions, yeah, he correct. was likely to, yeah, yeah, I agree and, with that. Yeah. And to answer Susan's question, I did find it, this emergency deal about blocking Brendan's release was filed with the second, or the seventh circuit court of appeals by Luke Berg, and he gave I'm not going to read it, but it's a pretty lengthy argument. It's not like real long, but he said it's against federal statute, blah, 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 blah. Thank you, Jeff. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, we mustn't, we mustn't forget here in, in that uh, in the um, full on bunk panel, it went 4-3. So it wasn't a unanimous in terms of like a 7-0. Um, it was a 4-3. That means that three, three of those judges uh, found the um, Judge Duffin's writ of habeas corpus uh, had to stand, right? And in the end, uh, Stephen, uh, Brendan Dassey sitting in prison based on opinions, right? Uh, the judges, uh, they present an opinion and they write down why uh, they gave a particular decision. And if you look at Judge Hamilton... Judge Hamilton didn't know the basic facts of the case. And that's why I spent a lot of time looking at uh, the burn pit, uh, Ida Maffel, and also Kiss the Girls. Uh, Judge Hamilton, 
uh, he didn't know the basic facts of the case. Uh, and essentially, that's what really did uh, Brendan in. Uh, Jack 61. Uh, I was actually going to, that was going to be part of the comments. I was going to, I'm going to try not Jack to talk 61. so much. Have you got a comment? Can you hear me? I don't think so. He just looks on mic. Can you hear me? All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yes. You can, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't want to, like, take too much comment, but what you said was that about Hamilton not knowing the case and a lot of details, salient details, uh, you know, surrounding everything that happened to Brendan. You know, three days prior, he stuck at Fox Hills under basically kidnapping uh, yes. uh, kind of thing. He didn't know any of that, or if he did, no. he, he didn't let it play into his decision. And so much of what they did to him Another thing that really bothers me, and we've discussed this at length, is the 2010 motion hearings for our motion. Oh, yeah. That, that entire thing, and I don't really understand, I, even to this day, and I don't know if, he had a, if Judge Fox had a Epstein throw a blackmail over his head. I just do not understand why he did not correct his decision or correct this case at that time. If he if he do if he, or if he didn't know all the details between uh, Kaczynski, O'Kelly, Kratz, yes. and that whole gang, if he didn't know all the stuff that was going on in 2007, he should have been mad as hell. I mean, literally seething yeah. mad and thrown the book at him, Correct. and and set that set this case for set him free, or set it at you know maybe a retrial or whatever. He should have corrected it, and he didn't. Uh, correct, correct. Uh, and if I think, thank you, Jack sixty one. If I could just make the comment, and this is actually quite chilling when you think about it, because um, uh, Kathleen Zona actually said, uh, and she said it very, very clearly. She said that um, you got to make sure that you know the case. You got to know the evidence of the case. Uh, and um, I think the main problem with for a no writer is that um, she knew the um, laws, but she didn't know all the facts of the case. Uh, otherwise, she could have corrected what the, the misconceptions that the judges uh, were saying about the case. And uh, I think that counted against Brendan. Um, I know that if Kathleen Zona had represented um, Brendan, I, I believe the outcome would have been very, very different. A BB. Well, I didn't like the fact that Knight Rider had to practice. Um, uh, yes. And I didn't understand why on this being his last shot at it. Uh, Stephen Glenn, is it? Um, Brendan's Drizzen. lawyer. Drizzen. Drizzen that's Drizzen. it. Drizzen. Yeah, I don't understand why he didn't do it before the unbox. Um, unbox. Um, yeah, um, um, yeah, and that she had to do all this practice with fake judges and people feeding her questions beforehand to get ready to be able to do it. Uh, yes. It's his last shot. The more experienced lawyer should have done that. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, well, I mean, <sighs> Laura Nyrider, don't forget, she actually won the first round, 2-1. Right? I know, but, but I just have a huge problem with it. Yes, but it wasn't unanimous. Um, you know, it should have been 3-0. Uh, the, the mere fact that, that one of the judges had dissented, um, that was a real concern. Um, Laura Nyrider, I see her as um, very professional, very academic, but she's not a brawler, right? Uh, Kathleen Zona gets down and dirty and really gets into the nitty-gritty of the case. What Laura Nyrider didn't do is go over the forensic evidence and have a look at how weak the state's case actually was. My feeling was is that um, they may have considered uh, Stephen Avery actually guilty and they were trying to disassociate Brendan from any crimes that took place. I think the angle should have been this crime never took place in the Avery salvage yard. Both men are innocent. 
my client is innocent and these are the reasons why. Um, I was going to ask you how much hmm. of an argument could have been had for the fact that they never corroborated any bit of that confession, even though, like, they know they came up with it. But I'm saying, if you had someone to walk in there to try to confess to something, let's say serial killing, what yes. are they going to do? They're going to try to corroborate every single little detail so there is evidence that it links to, and they did no such thing. Correct. And, th and that's why that's correct, um, Sammy. But that's why Judge Hamilton made fundamental errors in the case where he talked about, oh, yes, there was corroboration. We have uh, item FL. Uh, we've got the handcuffs. Uh, we've got no evidence that what Brendan said in Kiss the Girls had anything remotely to do with what he said. And yet... Uh, I did and also brought a presentation on Kiss the Girls. It's a pattern match. It's a 100% match. So how on earth can Judge Hamilton say, oh, there's no correlation at all? Uh, and Ida Maffel, clearly he had no understanding or idea of what uh, Dr. Palahniuk had, had found with Ida Maffel. And also with the handcuffs, and, and right? The handcuffs yeah. are sex toy handcuffs they uh, that's my big thing that's my big thing they they say okay well there's no evidence you know for brendan to use to get out but yet fl seems to be attached to his case why can't they use right. that for evidence i don't understand right. that be because the, the the issue here the way i believe the the seven circuit court uh, present uh, looked at this case they would have looked at it from the angle that the dissenting judges would have looked at it from the angle of saying Stephen Avery is guilty of having committed this crime. The only question in our minds is, was, the, was Brendan there? Did he help? Right? Whereas the approach should have been, this crime never took place at the Avery salvage yard. Right. So therefore, both men are innocent. So therefore, if Stephen Avery never killed Teresa Horbach, you can't drag in Brendan Dassey. And right. You see, and you see, that's the approach that Kathleen Zona would have taken. That's why she said in MAM 2, you've got to convince the judges uh, of the scenario. And that's right. why, if you remember, one of the judges said, oh, so they needed two killers. Yeah. And unfortunately, Nyrider had no idea and deflected it. Right? Yeah. And, right. And, and, and Kathleen Zona said, no, Judge, the reason why they wanted two killers is because you needed Brendan to point the finger at Stephen and blame him for the crime. Right? And also about the, about the bullets, you know, because Judge Hamilton said, oh, when were the shell casings found? Right? And no writer just said, oh, they were found in November. And Judge Hamilton said, oh, okay. Whereas Kathleen Zona said, Hey, look, Judge, this is a salvage yard. You know, Nyrider never even mentioned Roland Johnson, who actually owned the gun, fired 3,000 rounds, including into the garage, right? So you needed to put that element of doubt in the judges. Uh, Jack 61. The Jack salient Tom. details. This is where it comes down to, again, the details. These judges, it wasn't really, like you said, vote in their face. Yes. And said, look, no, you're wrong. This is what happened. You're reading this entirely wrong. This is, I mean, not saying it that way, but exactly that. Throwing it back at him and saying. Well, that, maybe that way. Maybe exactly that way. Yes. Right. I Correct. think that's why Kathleen's chart is so brilliant. Uh, yes. At the end of her. her uh, it says leave no questions. Response. Cannot right. leave any questions in the judge's minds. And I really Correct. believe that to hold very, very true, especially after hearing what this five last five minutes was. Correct. That's Correct. why I think it should have been the lawyer Steve instead of Laura up there because he's more experienced. Ah, uh, yes, that is correct. I think and maybe the, as a man more assertive. Uh, I agree well with be. you. I didn't want to be a sexist or whatever. Yeah, but I, I think agree. That 
could have helped a little bit. And also, let's remember that she only had 20 minutes. 20 minutes for Laura 20. and 20 minutes for that Luke Berg, whatever Berg. his name Luke is. Berg. Yeah, so th yes. that's a very highly stressful situation. And um, I wish uh, Steve and Jason presented it because um, there was intimidation in Laura's uh, voice. All we words. can all, of course, say that now sitting in our couches 15 years later. But, yeah, uh, Monday morning you know quarterback. What I mean? Exactly. <laughs> but um, if we're going to But there was in her voice in the practice. Fair, they, in the I, practice they, also, they it just, was in her voice. She acted very clinical in her presentation and where she out. should have been a little more human about it, I think. I don't know. Maybe that's what. Yes. Like, re and, yeah, sensical. Yes. And if you notice, um, in the first panel, the first with the three judges, they were hypercritical of Luke Berg, right? But Luke Berg threw it all back in the judges' faces. No, I don't agree. No, I don't agree. And so he basically hung on to a story uh, that had no substance to it. He had to, right? It was like a mini crap. Yeah. Yes, he threw it all back in the judges' faces. Whereas I think with poor Laura, uh, she was stunned. A as in uh, they were very, very critical of her. I don't think she had very good comeback. But here's the question, guys. Did Laura Nyrider and Stephen Drizzen, did they actually go to the Avery Salvage Yard? I don't think so. Good question. I don't think yeah, so. Did they, did they actually talk to any of the family members? Uh, that I can't answer. Um, you mean right, like because, Barb? Yeah, any, or any of them. I don't know. I, I, don't know. I, I, I want to know. The thing... The thing Go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yes, speak, Jeff. Uh, I, I, th I think the thing that we really have to keep focus on when, when we're analyzing um, Laura's performance at the trial and her statements and whatnot is the fact that the question that was before the court was about the admissibility of the confession. Yes. Not, not the merits of any of the, of the evidence. Now, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Silkman, that when the question was brought up, why do they need uh, a second killer? Two killers, that, yeah. To what, that was the real fumble that she made. If she had come down, that, that was her chance to, to really get into the forensic evidence and say, hey, look, you know, before his confession, they didn't have FL. They didn't have the hood latch swab. Uh, if you look at what they, during the confession, they, 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 put, they put him in the, they made him get in the garage, not out of the garage, because there was six inches of snow on the ground. Who shot her in the head? We did. Uh, all, all the things that they drove him to in the confession. Uh, really yes. was the was the was the um, the game the game changing evidence as you pointed out in your uh, presentation according, according to our favorite fat prosecutor. So yes. that was her chance, yes. and she fumbled it. Uh, and whether whether or, whether or not Stephen Drizzen would have fumbled it, I don't know. We we can only speculate, but she clearly did, and that could very well be the reason that he's sitting in prison today. Yes, but um, uh, thank you, Big Jeff, uh, Glenn Joe. Uh, they also brought in Seth Waxman, who was supposedly a really good lawyer. And he had presented yes. things that was court oral arguments, so it makes me wonder why they didn't actually get him to do the oh, oral they'll, argument. They'll, they were going to use him uh, if in, they in the Supreme Court yeah. in the Supreme Court, but unfortunately, yeah. he never got there. He he's been there. there. He's been there to the Supreme Court what four times, I think, more than any yes. other lawyer. And he yes. and to have him on the team should have just screamed to, that it was a great case for the Supreme Court to take because that guy doesn't get involved. I mean, he's another, you know, very, very well known what he does. Very good at it. Yes. And his, yeah, and his credibility is fantastic. So to me, they, have, they would have known that, you know what I mean, that he was going to represent that. You'd think the Supreme Court would go, well, this is worth checking out. He's been here many times. <laughs> yes, but they, they unfortunately declined to do so. So... You know, but it gives me it gives me great heart the fact that uh, three of the judges um, were in favour of Brendan, right? Four were against, but three were in favour, and it's a real tragedy to lose by such a narrow margin. And then it goes back to arguments: Did Laura present a good, strong case? I honestly don't think she did, and so. Um, it probably would have it probably would have swayed some of the judges 
to be conservative in their response. Uh, Alice. Um, uh, in my opinion, um, Judge Hamilton, um, I don't mean to sound ageist or anything like that, but Judge Hamilton and the other three judges, it's like they're part of the, the, the old school looking at things. So yes. why would it, like like why would he confess if it wasn't a true uh, sort of thing and they just weren't prepared to look any further than he actually confessed about it. So why would he confess if he was innocent? Correct. Correct. Um, yes, they did take a very old school approach. Uh, and to the letter of the law, they're probably correct. They didn't want to see the flip side of the argument to say, hey, look, innocent people do confess. Uh, they, they didn't want to venture into that, that so-called grey area. They took it as a very literal approach. Well, Brendan confessed. He confessed to all these crimes. Uh, sort of the forensic evidence, yeah, may match, may not match, you know, but he confessed. So I don't think that uh, Laura presented a strong enough case and I believe what let her down was uh, her responses to uh, the judge who talked about why they needed two killers. And I think that was detrimental uh, to, to, to uh, her client's case. A wizard, do you have a comment? Yeah. Um, Hamilton first mentions Brennan, Brennan's confession and then immediately goes into explaining why it's valid. And it, you know he, why, why, why he believes that it's straight up and genuine. And then later on in his reply, he goes on to say about how it's not the job of the call to um, yes kind of study the upcoming scientific literature and all the rest of it. Well, that goes to say it, that reinforces exactly what Alice was saying. He's of the old guard. Yes. He's, so, in that respect, he's part of the establishment which has existed for 20, 30 years before, you know, the last 15 years modern day thinking has even emerged. Correct. Now, if, Correct. He's, that, if he's that kind of indelibly stamped into the stonework of that way, of, of, of that mentality, you know, he's, that's what you're up against. So it, it does exist. Correct. It is an old school network, and it's I'll, I'll drop a phone call here, I'll drop a phone call there, and it puts our result in the bag before we've even walked into call. That's got oh, to yes. be, that needs to be wiped out. It's the establishment at its very worst. Yes, correct, correct. Uh, thank, thank you, Wizard. Uh, Susan, do you have a comment? Yeah, I just want to say that it just blows my mind how quickly the entire process was with the Seventh Circuit. We all know yeah. how slowly our courts work. But in Brendan's case, I mean, we're talking just a few months between the three-judge panel and the en banc. It all happened so quickly. Like their minds yes, made up automatically, right? How does that seven-judge panel even have time? to prepare for what they're going to hear, to really understand what the case is. Well, I think, um, I think Susan, um, the, whole, the whole panel would have been put on notice the first time round. So each of them probably would have been preparing for the case, and then they get randomly selected. And that's why, that's why uh, Brad Shim will make the comment, oh, it's a random selection of three judges. You're not going to, you don't know what you're going to get, uh, but we disagree with the decision. So I would say that all of the judges likely would have read the case and then they randomly select three. So they were most likely all of aware of what the situation actually uh, was. Uh, and then three were selected. And that's why Brad Schimmel said, hey, we don't agree with... Um, the outcome. So we'll take it to the full seven uh, circuit panel. Uh, Galataki, do you have a comment? I'm curious to know uh, this random panel of judges. Now, I apologize if I missed it earlier. Were they from the same area 
uh, that Dassey was like affiliated in any way with the local judges? Um, I, I do not know the actual origin. Weren't they of out of Chicago? I think they were, they were out of Chicago. Was Judge, Chicago. Judge yeah, Sox, he was held in Chicago. Judge Sox is from Wisconsin. I don't know about the rest. Yes. I wondered. Yeah. I, I wondered simply because uh, one of the things that caught my attention during your presentation was um, oh, I would almost liken it to a, a schmear campaign. You said that it was something about Dassey was a notorious killer, but this yes. guy is quite young, yeah. and I'm like, how could anyone possibly say that? Yes. Well, um, it, it's pretty obvious. If you, if you follow Man 1 and Man 2, uh, right from the get-go, uh, it was a, a massive smear campaign actually in the media. And the media, uh, they went along for the ride. Uh, the media, I, I don't believe the media actually cared for the truth. Maybe some people did, maybe some people didn't. They were there to sell newspapers and to get uh, coverage, uh, to get the, the kudos from their uh, coverage. And so the media played along as well. So it was like a circus. Uh, they were very, very clever. The estate was very, very clever. What they wanted to do is to present both Stephen and Brendan as the most dangerous people uh, in Wisconsin, right? So how in the hell can you label a Brendan Dassey as a notorious convicted killer when there was no forensic evidence against him? Galataki. Yeah, no, that, that was pretty much it. It just that, that threw me for such a loop that you have this apparent random panel of judges and then the person before me speaking brought up how quickly it moved along, as we all know, yes. to take time. And then it just begged the question, could there have been bias planted? I know it's supposed to be rigged in such a way that there isn't, but it makes you think the possibility's there. Uh, yes, correct. But... Um... Th thank you, Galataki. Neverly, do you have a comment? Yeah, I just, um, you know, kind of looking at the big picture, what happened to Stephen, we have talked about it over and over again, you know, why he is in prison. We have our theories and our feelings about that. Now, um, fast forward, we are at Brendan's child, the Ambank, and he, poor kid, he came so close. Remember, he had a social service person already, everything was Correct. figured out and approved. Correct. This also approved. costs money. So somebody paid all of this. I mean, I can't even put myself in his shoes, but uh, from, you know, watching from the couch, it was extremely, extremely aggravating and um, nerve wracking, basically. So now the state is in this position that they succeeded to put Stephen away. Brandon was a sacrificial lamb, to quote, you know, who the fat butt. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Correct. Now they, you know, enter Laura Nyrider and Stephen Drizen for Brendan and Kathleen Zellner for Stephen. And the state feels threatened. This is just my thinking. You know what I mean? Yes. So yes. now why would they let Stephen out? They know what's coming. First of all, embarrassment. Then the money. Egos bruised. And also, they really would need to admit that they were wrong again. Which the they second don't time want to around, do. yeah, and they would they never want to do. do that, right? That's only Correct. like logical to me. And Correct. they would also. The next logical question is then, who killed her? Who did kill Teresa? So somebody yes. is still on the loose. So they will yes. call every single emergency meeting, emergency um, court. Uh, what do we call it? Help me out with the word. Anyways, mm. they yeah. will just call any kind of, sorry, English is my second language. Yeah, uh, so they will do anything just to keep them there. And oh, when Schimmel correct. said, well, you know, it is Thanksgiving and uh, the Hallbugs are not going to, they don't have the luxury of hugging their daughter. As sad as that is, yeah, he know. said, oh I my know. God. First of yes. all, they what about Brandon's take, family? Exactly. Taking advantage of the Hallbugs at this point. They don't care about Hallbugs. They've been just they eating right as well, exactly, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And then, yeah. what are you saying about uh, about uh, with that statement? What are you saying, Shimmel? Are you saying then the Hallbucks are going to say, mm, yeah, I'm still sad. Let's keep him in the prison a little bit longer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. That's exactly I, what he was saying in a way. But, we, of course, we know that that has no merit. It's just that correct. he was using in the media. Yeah. Correct. Right. But but what, what is ultimate? Uh, sorry, not my verbiage. If I could just make the comment. Oh, sure. What, sure. Is, what, is so, what is so sad here is that the Attorney General is actually using the Hallbuck's name uh, for um, for for um, kudos and um, to get the media and also the wider public on his side. So you know the poor Hallbuck family that couldn't hug their daughter on Thanksgiving. The Hallbuck family are grieving uh, and reliving this every day. You know he never the the Attorney General never considered one thing. What if he is wrong? What if Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery are, in fact, innocent. Those words never crossed his mind. So, therefore, they came in with a plan. And that plan is uh, Stephen is an evil monster, influenced Brendan. Both of them are guilty. They should remain in prison until they die. That's the way they approached it. And the Attorney General was extremely aggressive in following that plan. Uh, Jack 61, do you have a comment? Well, yeah, he just played that emotional card. He couldn't open his mouth without mentioning the Hallbox. Correct. Not ever. Correct. Uh, but Jack 61, don't you find it amazing that never do you see the Hallbox family come to the microphone and give their version of events? Never. Not one time. Never. Never. Not one and time. And in a way, you can't really, okay, as I said, as horrible tragic it's like pain that will never leave that emotional pain when you lose somebody especially when it skips you know the order Correct. and the way they portrayed it, the uh, how Teresa, you know met her uh, what happened to her on the, her last day alive it's like oh my gosh are you saying that if the whole bucks say no that doesn't feel right to us that you're gonna keep he made it sound like that i know that's not the case i know he was just using that as Jack said, for the emotional card. But it's like ridiculous, slimy, and uh, so hypocritical. Because moves. we know, yes, we know that the, the Holbuck, if the Holbucks did not play into their advantage, they would smear them just like they did Stephen, just like they did Brandon and the whole Avery clan. Well, there's another connection there too, Neverly, and we can't ever forget that uh, Brad Shevel was good friends with Ken Kratz. We can never, yes, never in the band. What's it called, Jack? Alibi. Alibi. Yeah. That's correct. Well, that Alibi. Kind of, yeah. yeah, that kind of brings me to what I was wondering. How does um, Schimmel get, you know, to make his decision on this case? I mean, does does he have people like you know Fallon who reelection? You know, well, you know, you know what I mean. What what they did to Peg? They kind of used his, you know, Fallon used his eraser and presenting certain things that happened in the 1985 case. So does Schimmel have that same little secretary that erases things so he might make a decision a different way? Or is he allowed to just look oh, at this his own way? Or, you know, does he have advisors? You're talking about the, what Big Jeff and I talked about, about Jennifer yeah, Nash yeah, and, huh? and, yeah. and Tom Fallon and uh, yeah. that Bauer guy. What was his name, Jeff? Uh, uh, Dan Bauer or something that no, yeah. No, yeah you know when they were kind of taking their eraser away from the things they were oh, supposed to be showing pay. they took a chainsaw to it they, they well, took yeah. whole sections <laughs> but I'm wondering I'm wondering do are, does he have those same kind of advisors helping Schimmel to make a decision or is it Schimmel himself is that's what I'm you know uh, I'm sure he's got I'm sure he's got advisors we don't you know obviously we don't well, they all are fired he's got an army of people Correct. behind him Below here. It just doesn't look good. You, know, you gotta let them, you, you, the, your, your elect, the people who are running against you in election are going to say, oh, you let a murderer go free. It doesn't matter Correct. whether he's in a city. It's going to hammer up. Exactly. I think that's what it is. Guys, guys, I honestly believe I could be wrong and I wish that I, I'm wrong. But I honestly believe that they all know that Stephen and Brendan were innocent. 
I believe that too, because you can't be of rational mind and look at the legal situation and be a justice and not and see the, the evidence laws. and everything else. Correct. Correct. Uh, Alice, do you it's have a comment? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just that. It's not. It's not just that. It's the fact two of them have both been convicted on completely different things, but they're supposed to have killed the same person. How can anybody know see that? That because uh, Stephen got um, the mutilation, mutilating, uh, mutilating a corpse, taken away from his charges. But Brendan has been charged with that and the sexual assault and everything like that. It, ju it just blows my mind and makes me so angry that people that are looking at the both these cases and especially Brendan's case. That it's completely different charges. Uh, correct, correct. But at the end well, of the day, well, she's killed in two different places too. Oh, that's and true. Two different, different, different times. <laughs> that's that's correct. Two different, but by uh, one but, killer. By one killer, correct. And one but killer have, only. Oh my yes. god! Oh. But you have to you have to admit that 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 was um, uh, that was brilliant on the part of Ken Kratz. Because Ken Kratz knew that Brendan, if they were tried together at the same time, Brendan would have completely derailed the case against Stephen. Because Brendan would have recanted and said, look, uh, none of this took place. And so if you remember, and Jack61 will back me up on this, in the 2010 post-conviction hearings of Brendan Dassey, uh, they put uh, Ken Kratz on the stand. And Ken Kratz said, Oh, we didn't actually use any of Brendan Dassey's confession. That's right. But we actually tried. We actually tried Stephen uh, as a circumstantial case, right? So, in other words, they completely ignored Brendan. He and said, they tried uh, it. "I thought he said, but they were they went on DNA evidence or Correct. forensic and evidence, Correct. and then he Correct. goes and says on stand that." They did it on circumstantial. How can he get away with that? That's perjury. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is this, right? We all know the story, and Jack61 echoed this. Right? What they wanted to do is uh, O'Kelly Kaczynski got together with Kratz, and Ken Kratz said, look, get Brendan to be interviewed one more time. Get Brendan to write a two-page confession outlining everything that they did to Teresa Horbach. Get him to sign it. I'll present it to the judge. Uh, that way, uh, Stephen is guilty. He'll get put in prison for life. We'll do a deal with Brendan. We'll give him 20 years. Everyone's happy. We don't have to approach the forensic evidence. So they wanted to do it solely on confession. Yep. The trouble was, when Brendan gave that confession, he started to recant. It was a nightmare. It was. So that it means... Was. Yeah, that meant that Ken Kratz had to now go through the very difficult um, uh, court of presenting the forensic evidence. He knew that the case against Stephen was very, very flimsy, but he was able to convince a jury, and that was the problem. He wanted a clean confession that uh, May 13th interview when Kaczynski was allegedly off doing his guard duty stuff. He wanted a clean, correct, laid out confession. That is correct. Well, he didn't want the jury to see how they twisted everything. I think correct. Kratz knew he couldn't do it on just DNA like that. They had to make all that public opinion count for something and everything else. I mean, he had, have every bit of, everything he had to have every bit of this bullshit, excuse my language, fit together you know to make it stick because just him going like if it was just there was no brendan he wasn't going to get stephen he wouldn't have got stephen then After he got brendan press in there. Yeah. right and then he got brendan in there then there was a press conference and then oh my gosh yes he must be guilty you know i was yeah. right. gonna go on there and say he did all this stuff no way i i mean i i was for him for him now it changed my mind i mean that was public yes. he was convicted by public opinion that so yes, Kratz knew this and then when it, Brendan started taking back his confession, he said, okay, we got to think this out. This has got to be two different things here because when it comes to appeal time, 
because this is what I'm a firm believer of. They might have, you know, started out with something, little bit of detail. They had to make a lot of detail to get this far and keep these guys in there. They had to Correct. think of the appeal process. They had to think of what was going to happen in the appeal yes. process. Yes. That is why they gave away the bones, I believe. That is and why they're, they're cool. yes. That's Correct. my opinion. Correct. Correct. And was uh, it, no, Alice. was it, uh, um, I, I think it was in um, MAM 2 when Kratz was at the pre press conference. I think it was for one of Brendan's appeals. And he's standing yes. in front of the mics and everything like that. And That's somebody correct. says to him, who are you again? <laughs> Cor correct, correct. Uh, but but you can, that was in the first uh, uh, court, the three-judge panel. But what yep. you can see is that these guys were doing a coordinated attack. They were attacking um, uh, both Brendan. They were attacking the, his attorneys. And they were seeding the population by saying, no, 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 there was no coercion. Brendan Das is guilty. So they were uh, putting that information out in the public. So the public turned, the tide against Brendan turned. And, and that was so detrimental. These guys knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, Jack61, do you have a comment? Yeah, think about it. From the end of, well, let's just say the middle of February, uh, uh, Avery settles his case, hires Beauty and Strain. What did they do? They immediately went after Brendan. I mean, immediately. And everybody can read this. Anyway, let's move forward a little bit more. <coughs> the confession. This, this, they beat the crap out of him. He confesses. Now, one of the first things that Beauty and Strain did when they went to court was to, because they, Kratz and, and his his pals immediately added three more charges to Stephen, right? Correct. So Correct. what did they do? They they argued the reliability of Brendan's confession. And that continued for months into the pretrial. Months. They talked about this. Correct. The reliability of his confession. And even Strang said, I don't want to be standing here months later to get these charges off because of the you know unreliability of what Brennan has said and what ended up happening. They had to drop the, he had to withdraw the charges right before trial. That is correct. That's correct. That's correct. That uh, was and, all uh, that was all calculated. Yes. Uh, and Dean Str yes. And Dean Strang said to the family, it's great that these charges have been dropped, but all Stephen needs is one charge against him and he's in prison for life. So what they did was they um, obviously went for the charge that was going to have maximum impact on Stephen, murder one. And that's exactly what they got. And yet with Brendan, they got him on the sexual assault case and they also got him on mutilation of a corpse. Now, both of those charges were not, I mean, I know that with Stephen, the mutilation of a corpse was, uh, they found him not guilty. How can they possibly find Stephen not guilty of that and yet find Brendan guilty of mutilation of a corpse and sexual assault when there was no forensic evidence forensic against evidence. that? And no and, murder. And he yeah, it's real. How did he murder somebody and then the bones end up like that? He had nothing to do with it. No, I mean, uh, it's such a contradiction. This is so oxymoron. These, oh my God, they're all, they're all fired. Those three new charges stop Steve from getting his getting out on bail. They yeah, upped his bail. I don't think they were. I don't think they were ever going to allow it anyway. No. Yeah, I think they were used as leverage too. Absolutely, and to further drag him, you know, through the mud. Correct. Correct. A uh, wizard, do you have a comment? Um, yeah, regarding um, the two kind of narratives employed to convict two different people of the same murder. Um, yes. Well, the way I see it is like we've spoken a lot about media uh, manipulation, influence, etc. The coverage given to the run up to the trials, because I think. Stephen was convicted a long time before it had got anywhere near a call. Um, we, we're talking about public opinion and, in, and influence in the public, and that's how they manipulate the press. And it, you can't say the jury pool wasn't tainted with the information given over during the press conferences. 
Now, I think Ken Kretz employed Fassbender and Weaver to target Brendan to get that confession. That confession was the tool that Ken Kratz needed to convict Stephen Avery. Because up until, yes. that, up until that point, he had nothing. Now, he put that tool to immediate effect by blasting it out. I hope there are no 15-year-old kids or less listening. And if you are, you better switch off. I mean, what, a, what, a, what a move. What a move. That is absolutely... You, you, yeah, it's the worst thing you can do as a prosecutor because it takes your whole case. Now, he's put that out there and he's used Brendan's confession to convict Stephen. The yes. public are already getting it into their heads that Stephen is guilty. So everyone walking into that, no, I don't care about pre-trial polls and all the rest of it, you know, entry, exit, surveys, it, it, it's, it's irrelevant. Those people walked into that call and the majority oh, yes. of them probably thought that Stephen was guilty and they were going to vote that way regardless. Correct. He was convicted Correct. in the, it was trial by media and Ken Kretz manipulated the media by using the tool of Brendan Brent and that's his confession to convict Stephen Avery. Correct. Correct. And that's, that's not without checking the veracity of uh, Brendan's statements. Uh, and again, let me just emphasize again the importance of them finding item FL and how they used that as a trick, right? As soon as they found that bullet and as soon as they discovered uh, Teresa Horbach's DNA on it, uh, both Brendan and Stephen were, found, were guilty in the minds of everyone. Done right? for. That ended it. Yep, they were done. They were gone. They were gone ski. No matter what they said, uh, that item of film was damaging uh, to both Brendan and Stephen because finding that DNA on that bullet meant that the whole story was true, that both of them were involved in the murder. If, for example, how can you explain why Teresa Horbuck's DNA is doing on a bullet in Stephen Avery's garage? Well, we now know that the bullet is bogus. A Glenn Joe. Yeah, I was just thinking there's so many uh, credible professionals spoken out for Brendan. Lawyers, judges, forensic experts, I and mean, even Steve Moore, ex-FBI uh, expert. Correct. What exactly is it going to take to help Brendan? Well, and, and also don't forget uh, Professor uh, Richard Leo, who's an expert. Oh, 250, yeah. 250 letters were written on on. Brendan's behalf to state, uh, I mean, professionals, you know what I mean? With great credibility. How many prosecutors? How, how many Why prosecutors? Why against? When so many people have looked at it and completely see it from Brendan's point of view, and yet there was, it was a 43 decision against him. Well, the, the thing is this, and this is the way I've worked it out. So let me just take a minute. The problem is this. The problem comes down to the read technique. And if you listen to the en banc panel, the full en banc panel, one of the female judges, I forgot her name, she was very, very scathing to Laura Nyrider. And she said to her, oh, so you want us to come up with a new law, do you? That was Sykes. And Sykes. That was yeah, you, that yeah. is a trick. That, yes. That. yes. Yes, and, and that when Sykes said, you must lose, that's it. That was the case then and there. So it all that boils down to, yes, it all boils down to this, the read technique. Because if they let Brendan go, Judge Hamilton said, okay, if we let him go, then what's going to happen to all the police confessions done by the read technique, are they now inadmissible? So they didn't want to open themselves up to criticism. So what did they do? They found him guilty. They overturned Judge Duffin's decision because it meant that if you have mental deficiencies, if you've got a low IQ, you don't have legal representation, 
you're another kid like Brendan. The re-technique is going to beat out of you a false confession. That made those judges nervous because it now meant that everyone who was questioned with the re-technique can now put up their hand and say, uh, Judge, I was coerced. But so wait, therefore, yeah, but, what? but wait, it was a new law. Remember, he was the first one to be recorded, yes. um, video recorded, and they were yes. no longer to use the read technique anymore. Yes, but the arguments of the judges were uh, they didn't want that, they saw nothing wrong with the way Fassbender and Uyghur interrogated Brendan. Right? Because right. it and was convenient for them. <laughs> Again, yes, they yes. seen no fight. They seen no struggle to, you know, correct to fight against it. Was him. A, it was another poor argument by Nyrider. Uh, she should have said but by that time it, it had already been established that um, Weigert and Fassbender were examples of exactly how not to use the read technique and exactly that why is not correct. To that, 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 that is correct. That's how she should answer the, the question. The right? read that's technique that's was that not be used anymore. Right. Brendan, there we go. Brendan, Brendan was struggling. <laughs> Sorry, Brendan, Brendan was struggling from the second he walked in the door. He sat right. down and he was absolutely lost. He was in a black hole and those two guys were his only light, his only yes. ladder out of that room. And they just absolutely screwed him over. Yes. He right. wasn't yes, prepared yes, for that. Yes, he wasn't equipped for it. I saw plenty of struggle, and that was without the intimate need. And they repeatedly. And the, oh, let me put my hand on your shoulder and offer you some comfort. They repeatedly what a load of promised him leniently. What a load of, oh, oh. Correct. And, and that was the point, the obvious. And lawyers across America are using that uh, coerced confession to teach other lawyers who are learning. That's what I mean. That's my biggest question. That's Correct. my biggest Thing. You're going to tell everybody of the world that this is not what you do. This is how you get a coerced confession. Do not use this. This is a great example of a wrongfully, you know, uh, uh, of a confession that was coerced using Brendan. But yet that poor boy is in prison and they know it's wrong and they don't let him out. How can that be? I. It, that's my biggest question. It's because the judges, the judges did not want to admit that the technique that was used by Fassbender and Wigert had fatal flaws, right? Because they didn't want to admit cases. that. Yeah, they would have other people, and I think that's what you, what you were trying to say before too. Was they would get so many backlog cases oh, saying, of course. Hey, I did this, I did." Because if you watch that, um, how to stop a drug scandal, that was a yes. perfect example of that. Yes, you know, so I'm sure they were trying to avoid that, but yet they there's got to be some way where they could have said, so, you know, this is this is there a was the new law yeah. right then. Yeah, the, he the, was the first the, one to fall under. And another the, thing is, why is it Brendan's fault that the judges were getting nervous about the possibility of other Im imprisoned people to raise their hand and say, hey, what about me? What does Paletical, that have to do with Brendan? Right. And his yeah. justice, yeah. With, it, with the view in mind that they are so staunch in the defense of the Reed technique, I think it might be interesting if someone was to look up the history of the directors or kind of advisors to the board with that company and see who's drawing Oh, the they changed from it. Them. I can oh. tell you, I've seen a guy that invented that. He is on the opposite side now. He was interviewed wow. once. He was interviewed mm -hmm. once and he does, he's on the total opposite side. And he was one that helped invent that. And he, uh, now he goes, he's, he's a speaker for Brendan. He's totally convinced. And he even wrote a paper for Brendan. But yeah, he, wow. he does different. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So at least one of them seen what it did well, and he changed it and he it, changed yeah. it right he does no more part of that right right yeah well uh professor richard leo he wrote um an affidavit uh which we went through and he said that with the re-technique individuals like brendan dassey are highly highly susceptible of giving a false confession and you see the judges i believe 
knew that, but they never wanted to admit that because if they admitted that that was correct, that means that they had to affirm Judge Duffin's decision, which meant that Brendan would have ultimately walked. They were not prepared to do that, right? They were not prepared to no. say that that technique, the way it was used against Brendan, was fatally flawed. Because if Brendan walked, it meant that Stephen's case all of a sudden was going to look stronger. Jack 61. You know, I just had a thought, and actually I had two thoughts, so bear with me. This is going to, it won't take long. So, number one, I think about the Ken Kratz video that he released of Stephen and his lawyer, and Brendan was at the same jail. That's number one. Think about if there's any recorded whatever of Brendan and his legal people. Number two, I think about now this lady, and I'm not going to talk about this much because we're going to cover it more tomorrow, far more in depth tomorrow. I think about Henry's latest uh, post talking about the inappropriateness uh, use or whatever use uh, of how Weigert handled evidence. And I don't care what his rank was, uh, what his title was in 2005, 2007. Why was yes. he handling? Why was he handling evidence in 2012 in Stevens case? And this not, and I'm not trying to point this directly at Brennan. I'm just saying the how this cop, this lead detective, investigator, I'll whatever, show you. yeah, yeah, it, in handling this case and how it was approached, it was like it was like open season to me. Yes, correct, correct. Uh, uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? Uh, thank oh, you, Bibi. I can't reach my phone right now. Yeah. No. I still no cannot. Um, Never oh, sorry. Yeah. I still cannot get over the fact that uh, nothing has been done to Kratz for pulling the stunt of convicting Stephen on one timeline, one person and one person only, which is Stephen Avery, with. Um, Immunity. Yeah. And with that uh, press conference and convicting Brandon with a different timeline, different place, different uh, method of killing and whatever. I just still cannot understand how well, that led. Well, it might, it might happen. make you feel good, never lead to know that he can be civilly sued by Stephen. So when Stephen does get out, he can sue the hell out of him for doing all the stuff he did after he right. was out of the office. Correct. He should sue before. If he can find him. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, look, my, my, no... Can I just say one thing here? Uh, yes, my thing with, Bre with Brendan was um, about this, you know, they're, they're saying that the read technique, they didn't want to, you know, of course, have backlash from admitting that that wasn't working. But they could have put like some kind of stipulation of, of Brendan's circumstances are different than a lot of people's. He doesn't understand. He has a language problem. Too many words. You know, he, he just yes. shuts yes. out. He has a special, uh, you know, his language. He doesn't hear the language and accept the language and understand language like we do. So that's a that's a special circumstances. I mean, I think they could have did something like that without just saying the re technique didn't work and it never worked, um, which I probably believe it never did. But um, you know yes. what? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, with yeah, he gets that. He gets that. The cat ran, but he doesn't get the cat ran and 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 grabbed the ball and then he came back and then he ran. You know, he's too many words. Verbiage. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Uh, wizard. Nice. Sorry, yeah. Um, oh, it's gone right out of my head now. Sorry. Pass on that one. Carry on. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, in regards to the read technique, um, how come both Judge Williams and Judge Rovner understood the damage that the read technique uh, did to Brendan, yet Judge Hamilton disagreed? That's the scary part. So, in effect, guys, isn't it just opinions and perception? So, is Brendan in prison because the way people perceived things, right? Not because he was guilty or not guilty. 
It's their perception. That, to me, is the worrying thing. Remember, um, Brendan's legal team lost narrowly by one vote. And I think Judge, uh, Judge Sky, Sykes, I reckon she was the determining factor going from one side to another. Uh, I think that, that was the one that, that turned the tide. Guys, does anyone have any comments? No. Are we all good? Well, Neverly, Neverly. No, no, it's okay. I was going to reiterate what you said, like when Hel Hamilton specifically said in his report, it appears. You know what I mean? Yes. It appears. So, so what if it appears? Is it or is it not? Yes. Yes. That's what you were uh, saying, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yes. A uh, Glenn Joe. Thank you, Neverly. Yeah, Glenn Joe. They were saying that it doesn't, he says it doesn't look coerced, but it doesn't bring up the fact that it also was never corroborated in any way. Tell the yes, judges so that it was obviously coerced, but it's obvious yes, to right. all the judges that there's no evidence there that corroborates anything Brendan says. That is correct, except Judge Hamilton believed that there was corroboration, right? But clearly there was not. He had, he had a poor understanding of the forensic evidence. And that's why I echo with what Kathleen Zona said. You've got to make a story of the case. I think Nyrider was too hell-bent on the legality rather than the actual human story. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of that, it failed to convince, obviously, four judges. Uh, Alice, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, if Stephen gets exonerated, does that automatically mean that Brendan will be set free as well? No. Nope. No. 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 It, no. It's no. really no. like That's the saddest part. probably never be released unless the governor gives them relief. Because yeah, Brendan is, is convicted on, well, I'll say their words because they were, but he is convicted on words and they have already, they, he's done all of his legal everything. He hasn't filed the 976 yet, but I don't know, you know, that's forensic testing. So, uh, you know, I yeah. don't know. I, I don't and see it. No so forensic it's evidence. Good, it's a good realization, and it's really, really, really hard to put your head around this. But legally, uh, Brendan, Brendan doesn't really have a chance unless somebody pardons him. And or, lets him out. or somebody else confesses. Or the, him or the convicted it. killer. Right. Somebody confesses. Anyway, that is, and the, that governor, the governor doesn't want to touch it because of the sex charge, because of the rape charge. Yes, correct. Which they couldn't Correct. prove anyway. How are you going to prove she was raped? It was his words. He, he he was, yes, it was his words. Yeah. No forensic. Exactly. His words they, are golden. His words yeah, are golden. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch Dream Killer. Another Kathleen. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. Yes. And the direct yes, parallel. Yeah. Okay. So yes. remember the and direct Charles parallel still in this there. case? Charles is still in there because yep. he confessed. Yep. Correct. And after Correct. he recanted, they called him a liar. Yep. And he's Correct. still fighting to this day to get out. Yeah. Correct. Because he came out with a, a plea bargain. So they're not going to release him at all until the, uh, well, he's in prison for another few years. Is that correct? And then he gets free because he came up with a plea deal. Yep. yep. Uh, I and think he's, see, got, he's not very much longer, but Brendan has a long time. Correct. I mean, that's and you see, 28 years. Yes. And that's the irony. And that's why Ken Kratz said, well, if he had agreed to a plea deal, Brendan would have been out in a, in a few more years. But the ultimate thing is this. Would you agree to a plea deal if you never committed such a horrendous murder? No. Never. No. Never. No. Plea never. deals are for the state. That. Plea deals Correct. are for the state. That's all it is. Sadly, though. It's making you badly. admit something that you didn't have to do, but the state still wins their case. That's what that's Correct. about. Sadly, though, many people who did not commit crimes do take the plea deals. Yes, they do. Just yes. Because they're afraid of having to do the full amount of time. The West Memphis Three did, 
Yes, yes, they did, correct. and so did um, the the some of the Central Five, right. but they were also the two, uh, the two took the plea to save the one in West Memphis Five or three. And yeah, they all had to take it to save the one's life. Yeah, yes. but the two did it. They the two save two his three life. Do it to save yeah. Damien yeah. Echo's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, they're still they're, they're still the convicted actors. killers. They've never been exonerated. And another right. tragic pin in this Brenda's story is that even if he took the plea, he would need to register as a sex offender. Correct. And if we are to believe Brenda's words, he's a virgin. He never had sex before. Right. Yes. Yes. How and I um, might fall back. Yeah. Uh, Brendan would be a hero if he actually admit in the hallback size. Which is strange. Mm. Yes. Yes. Oh, look, the whole thing, the whole thing is very, very tragic. Uh, and I believe that uh, Brendan, is, he's now a political prisoner. And my gut feeling is that Stephen Avery will be released. And I believe the cruel twist of fate is that they'll keep Brendan in. Now, you think about this. I agree. The person who has no forensic evidence against them will be kept in prison for another 28 years. I agree. The person that had forensic evidence against him will be released because the forensic evidence was all flimsy. Now, how ironic is that? That's why the tragedy for me is that uh, for Brendan, uh, he's in prison because of just words, right? No proof, no proof against him. But the state will not let that kid go. He's going to remain in prison, and that's a tragedy. It's, it's disgusting. It's, it's absolutely big. disgusting that the fact that Stephen can get exonerated and he, he can't eh, when they're supposed to have been committed the, 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 the same crime. Yes. But they tried him separately, and Brandon confessed. Correct. Correct. Well, Stephen Avery never confessed. Mind. He never confessed. Well, no. look, guys. I'm a it's little bit conscious of the time. Yeah, I'm a that little bit a conscious thing. of the time. Um, do we have any final comments? Uh, Alice, do you have any final comments? No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, Bibi, do you have any final comments? Well, yes. It's been a good run. Coffee's been a good run. I've enjoyed it. Um, coffee's kept me going at times. <laughs> um, it's been a blast uh, I look forward to our other projects that we work on in the future awesome I will miss coffee awesome. yes hopefully there'll be a part three and we can dust off coffee again and for sure go another round for sure for sure yep can't, can't wait I hope the hope there is a season three and of course um, a foul play and the team will definitely cover it uh, Columbo, Columbo, do you have any comments? Uh, no comments, Columbo. Uh, Gal Galataki, do you have any final comments? Nope, just thanks for having me. It's been uh, very good listening for the past few weeks. No, pleasure, pleasure. Thank you so much. Glenn Joe, do you have any final comments? Uh, just to say thank you for a great presentation, a great discussion again. And uh, to all the panel, the, the discussion and the podcast have been absolutely amazing lately. It's just great work that everybody's doing. So it's great to take part in it. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Columbo. Thank you, Glenn Joe. Uh, Jack61, do you have any final comment? Uh, just uh, thank you and everyone that's been involved. I haven't been on been a foul play that long, but for all the hard work and and uh, getting these things presented to a larger audience to continue the involvement and to further the case and not to let it go and keep the information correct, right, keep it keep the information flowing. And even if it does get seem to get tiring to us, there are always new people joining, and it only correct. takes it only takes one the right person maybe to get this case unlocked. Anyway, great job. Correct. Thank you very much, Dr. Suckman, for your excellent work. No, thank you. Thank you very much as well. Thank yes, you, Jackson. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Kim Eastwood, do you have any comments? All good? Neverly, do you have any final comments? Yeah, I just wanted to thank the panel for having me and accepting me in this group. It's been a um, roller coaster of emotions, um, hard work, it sure but has. pure pleasure, pure pleasure to being here and discussing the case. And honestly, I grew personally. I noticed some growth that I think differently, um, and I'm thankful for that. And Dr. Silkman, special thanks for working with you. It opened my eyes. Um, <laughs> how smart you are how no. hard you work yes no. yes yes no. yes take the credit please and uh, the no. minute, uh you know when i figured out that you're really smart and that you know what you're doing is when you're doing your uh presentations and you're going over the slides and then you add your comment and i don't ever know the difference if you're reading a scientific a forensic report or you're talking yourself <laughs> so yeah that's no, thank you. like wait what yes anyways no. it's been and all, great and, and all the good luck to steven steven and brendan will never quit yes and also uh, i want to thank you neverly for helping me out uh, putting the presentations together it's good to have someone to bounce ideas from as well and that that, that that's been awesome Thank you so oh, much. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, now, do we have any final comments from Nothing But a Stump? <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, first of all, thank you to Foul Play as a team. I have um, never felt more welcomed and more um, uh, involved and included in something um, as I have the, in the Foul, team, Foul, Foul Play team. And also uh, to Dr. Silkman, uh, so much that I've learned from you, your your presentations have always been instructive and brilliant, and I've learned a lot from you, and I've learned a lot about um, decent hu decency, humanity, and patience from you, so thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say that I'm very fortunate to be part of this team. Uh, I consider myself just a small wheel in a big uh, cog, uh, and uh, we all function together, and what I love about our team is that each person brings their own um, to the cases, uh, their own expertise, their own energy, their own enthusiasm, uh, and I'm very, very proud to represent the group and do the best that I can. And uh, I'm really, really happy, and I'm um, very blessed to be part of the team. And uh, not my verbiage. Do you have any final comments? Of course I do. Come on. <laughs> First of all, I have to say, Dr. Silkman, it is always a pleasure listening to you, talking to you when you're cussing or when you're teaching, because I, I learn a lot from you. Yeah, you know, and everybody else in foul play. Wonderful. And it's it, this community. It shows what team really is. It also shows that you accept, uh, you know, these are people from all around the world. So they got all yes. different kinds of, you know, um, bringing up, you know, the way they were brought up, the way they were schooled. And we all come together. And our main thing is truth and justice. And we do it all in our own little ways. Like, hey, I'm a goofball, you know, and <laughs> that's just me. But we all do it for the same cause. Yes. And I just think that's brilliant. And I thank every one of you for allowing me to be a part of it. Oh, not at all. And I think that underlies our strength. Uh, the fact that we're so very, very diverse and uh, everyone puts in their little two cents worth and together it makes a really strong picture. And what always impresses me is the um, magnitude uh, of discussions uh, that we cover. And you think about it, we've done a lot of um, uh, different forms of presentations, coffee, uh, TTTs, PPPs. Uh, special little presentations and it's awesome because uh, everyone puts in their little effort and even uh, manning the the chat you know i must admit i'm not always in the chat but there are people like bb sammy uh, zoe let's don't forget uh, they spend a lot of time in chat talking to new people and uh, that's awesome and plus we have jack 61 and susan who are doing the readings 
uh, and you learn so much, um, you, you never stop learning, and, and, and that really is amazing. Thank you so much. And just just, and just sprout, sprout out of, of, of other channels, too, because you all contribute to the other creators, which is wonderful, and I think it's yes. fantastic. Yes, it is, and, and it's awesome. It really is awesome. Uh, Cecilian, do you have any comments? Probably just listening in. Uh, Susan, do you have any final comments? Susan's all good. Uh, she might have had to stop out. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I was nice. talking oh, with my mic muted. <laughs> hey, uh -huh. Susan. There do you, you have go. Any uh, final comments? Yeah, I'd like to also thank Foul Play for welcoming me, welcoming me with open arms. And uh, it's just such a wonderful place to be uh, to study this case and learn so much about it. And your hard work, Dr. Silkman, I can't imagine the number of hours that you have put into this case. Your, your presentations are just spot on, just beautiful, beautifully done. And thank you so much. No, no, thank you. Thank you. And uh, also thank you for your tireless effort, Jack61, in doing the readings. Um, it's actually very interesting going back and listening to the readings again. You pick up so much now. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and some of the readings are very hard uh, to go through, but both you and, and Jack61 do a, a superb effort, and we're very lucky to have you guys. Thank you so awesome. much. I've, I've you, learned Mr. a lot Krat. just by reading it. It's very <laughs> interesting. Don't forget to and thank you, Mr. Kratz. Oh, God. <laughs> He's um, not here company. today. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, Wizard, do you have any final comments? Yes, I would like to say a huge thank you to the foul play team, yourself, Zoe, all the rest of the crew. You have made me so welcome, and it has been an absolute pleasure to be made a guest of your panel. I've loved every moment of it. I was sad it's come to an end. Let's hope we can do it all again. Oh, it's brilliant. I'm going to miss you guys so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. No, no, no. Thank you, Wizard. And I just want to personally say uh, your insight and knowledge um, is second to none. Uh, you have a, a very different perspective on things. Uh, I love your sheer uh, honesty. Uh, and you say it as it is. And, um, yeah, your perspective um, uh, on the case and your own personal experience uh, has been so awesome. And uh, I'm sure all of us have learned a rule lot. And, and that's been fantastic. Thank you, Wizard. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you to say. Good luck for the future. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, Sammy, do you have any final comments? Yes. Yeah. I wanted to say your level of credentials has done justice in this case for the arguments made for the innocence of Stephen Avery and Brenda Nassi. And along with your doctorates, you have now earned, and this is my, from my world, in my language, you have now earned street cred. Right on. <laughs> you got it, G. G. So Yes, th yeah. thank, we thank love you. So you. Much, I Sammy. love you like a brother. And I want everybody to know this is not the end of our play. We are going to continue on. We're going to keep shaving oh, yeah. on. Yep. It's yeah, just, it's the, just end the, the copy, copy, the series, just the copy segment. Correct. Yes. We're not Correct. going Correct. anywhere. We We're not going away. anywhere. We're tying Dr. Silkman up, and he's not going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> he's already yeah. shackled. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, but, you know, uh, just echoing that, yes, it's the end of foul play in terms of, like, the coffee, uh, because with coffee, we looked at both MAM1 and MAM2, and I think that was a strategic, really good move to do, because we started from scratch, and we looked at the case, both cases, from a fresh set of eyes, and by having these panels, discussion panels, uh, everyone was able to bring in their uh, comments of their experiences, their personal backgrounds, and it's just been awesome. Um, kind of like putting it under the microscope. Yeah, um, which uh, which uh, Dr. Eisenberg never did, right, with the bones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's uh, for me, it's been a fantastic personal journey 
Um, I thought I knew the case. Boy, was I wrong. Um, uh, by doing the coffees, by listening to all the presentations, uh, I've learned so much and I'm learning so much more. I'm glad that I got into uh, Brendan's uh, case uh, much more um, than just superficial. I learned to rule a lot. I learned about the devious nature of human beings, um, the mere fact that you have an attorney general uh, who personally took it as a mission to make sure that Brendan never got released. And as you can see throughout the presentations, you have one constant figure all the time, and that was Brad Schimmel. He appeared all the time. He hid under the guise of the Horbach family and, and used it to manipulate the media, the hearts and the minds of the media and the general public. And uh, it's truly, truly disgusting. Uh, hopefully, uh, in time, uh, justice will prevail and uh, the two boys uh, eventually will be released. I believe that we're very lucky, or Stephen's very lucky, to have um, uh, Kathleen Zona to represent him. She's one smart lady, but the important thing is she's a brawler and a fighter, right? So she's going to hit the state for six, which is awesome. All right, um, Neverly, did you have a final comment? Yeah, I just noticed that Malia joined us, so oh. I wanted to acknowledge her. Yes. Yeah, she may have, uh, does, she may have foul words or thoughts or something. Does Malia have a, a final comment? A comment? Don't be shy, Malia. <laughs> Probably a little bit shy. Uh, Jack61. I just wanted to... Uh, mentioned that we will be doing a uh, presentation for PPG tomorrow. Is that right, Sammy? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, we're going to be doing Powder Puff podcast. Yeah. Yep. So oh, the girls are back. Look out! Oh yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that was all right, guys. All right, guys. Um, well, again, thank you all. Um, you know. We it is an absolute pleasure to be part of the Foul Play team. Like I said, um, I learned a lot. We have all learned a lot. Uh, we both, we all of us here believe that uh, Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery are innocent, that they were framed, that they were set up. And it's up to us to educate the wider public. Uh, and um, I think um, Not My Verbiage uh, said an important comment it's important that we give ourselves not only to foul play, but to others as well. If you, I noticed that a lot of people are calling me up now to be part of panels and a part of their lives. Paul Capaldi, Eric Cozy, also Millbilly. That's important, guys, because it means that you can give your expertise, you can give your opinion. Um, foul play works hard, but there are other many uh, excellent YouTubers who've got their own separate channels that also work very hard. And remember, guys, we're all working in the same direction. You know, uh, we may do things slightly different, but in a way, we're here for justice, justice for the boys. And that's very important. All right, guys. Um, hopefully, uh, all catch up soon, and it'll be great to do further presentations. Um, please check out our uh, Foul Play website. Uh, there's a lot of fantastic information on that website uh, and the, the individuals that uh, upkeep that website, they do a magnificent job. And also our YouTube channel, like I said, we've got over a 1,000 supporters now, subscribers, and uh, that's awesome. We value your comments. We value your contributions. Okay, guys. I'm in desperate need for a coffee. Thank you so much. <laughs> this has been a Foul Play production. <laughs>